Good morning. Good to see you all. Man, it's a good series we're in, Deleting Destiny. How many of you have seen people that were walking with Jesus, and then it seemed like all of a sudden went the other direction? How many of you have seen people that testified of the goodness of God in the land of the living, and then all of a sudden it seems like they went backwards? Okay, so that's a real deal, and I'm gonna, I want to talk today about our thinking. And I think this is going to be good because the scriptures, Genesis to Revelation, talk a lot about our thinking, a lot about our thoughts, a lot about our minds, and you have thoughts. How many of you have good thoughts? And how many of you have diabolical thoughts? Isn't it interesting how it seems to be a coexistence sometimes? You know, it's like, man, one minute you can be like, Oh, Jesus, you're so good. Oh, I think about you all the time. Next thing you know, you're lusting after a new car. You're lusting after something. And it's like, what happened there? There's a battle. There's a war. It's real. It's 24 hours a day, and it's in your mind. And so I want to look, look at exposing some dysfunctional thinking. Now, when we get done, you're going to go, Oh, he should have mentioned that verse. Oh, what about those series of verses? I'm just telling you, I have limited time. If I can get out of here with you thinking about really taking serious what you think and how you think and how much worldly thinking has got into your mind and how much word needs to drive that out, boy, that will be good. I'll go home. I'll be very satisfied. So I want to talk to today about dysfunctional thinking. At the end of 2020, I was, like many people, glad to get over that year and then looking forward to a fresh start. Now, how many of you get really excited at the first of the year? You, you think, oh, I'm going to set some goals, or, you know, and you make all these lofty plans. And I was excited to do that. I had a lot of things circling around. And I thought, okay, January 1st, man, I was going to start putting things on paper. And, you know, I, I was just, there was some, some plans that I had, some goals. I, I was looking forward to getting them down on paper, some books that I wanted to read. I was, you know, I was getting really lofty, you know, in my goal setting. And I thought, but I'm going I'm to wait till January 1st to put them down. And, you know, I had scribbles and scratches. And then... After midnight, happy new year, I had a fever. And it was like I woke up in the middle of the night, an excruciating headache, a fever. I don't get fevers, man. And so had this fever going. Body started aching, started, you know, just kind of shaking, feeling really crummy. And, you know, long story short, I got COVID from, you know, not Pakistan, not Haiti, not Puerto Rico, but from an unnamed roommate in our house. And so, that, so it was January 1st, and I feel like hell. And I'm in bed, and everything's aching. And, and this is a weird side effect. My back felt sunburned. Like, what the, what is that? And it was like, oh, and then it was like lethargy. And, and, you know, my wife will attest to this. I don't get sick, but when I do, there is no bigger baby on the planet. And, and so... I get up, I got COVID, and we're taking a temperature, it's all bad, I go to the couch, I'm laying on the couch, it's happy new year, I'm supposed to be excited about this year, I feel like hell, and I'm laying on the couch, and I make it for two weeks, bed, couch, chair, couch, chair, D3, vitamin C, elderberry, zinc, <laughs> couch, chair, elderberry, vitamin C, D3, zinc. And then looking at the clock, anticipating going to bed for two weeks. And you know, I, I can't tell you, the body was, was jacked up. It felt horrible. But let me tell you what was more insidious. The thinking when you're in that state. And how quick you go from anticipation, it's a new year, I'm going to read this stack of books, I'm going to these countries, I'm going to win this many people to Jesus, I'm going to read through the Bible three times this year, to I think I'm going to die. <laughs> and it was all right here. Let me just say that your life that you're living right now, for better or for worse, is the sum total of your dominant thinking. That was true, it is true, and it will be true tomorrow. Change has to happen in our mind. Change your thinking, you change your life. 
one of the most diabolical thoughts you will ever entertain is that you can't change. Okay. That's one of the most diabolical thoughts. You're too old. Your past is too hard. You came from this. You came from that. You're stuck. You're never going to change. You've tried to change before. You've tried to set goals. You've tried to read the Bible. You've tried to pray X number of minutes or hours a day. And you failed, 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 failed. And you're stuck unchangeable. Let me just say, that is a big, fat lie. You can change. I've known people in their 20s that didn't change because they didn't change their thinking. I've known people in their 70s and 80s that experience new life and new seasons in Christ because they are willing to change their thinking. Change and bondage is non-discriminatory. I tell you, I, I have my eyes set as I, as I get into the mid-60s. I have my eyes set on only a handful of people in their 80s. They're my models, Fred and Judy, Fred and Marilyn. I watch them because they never settle for status quo. They're never limited by their age, ever. Their passion is always good. It's intense. I remember having a lady at my church up in Washington. She's a little old lady. I don't know how old she was. She was old. And she came up to me, and she says, she says, Pastor Bob, I just want to tell you, if you ever see anything in my life that doesn't line up with scriptures, you call me out on it. I'm thinking, that will never happen. One of the sweetest, most godly women I've ever met in my life. Hey, yeah, you know, I want to call you out on something. No, <laughs> no, you can change at any age. Everything is subject to change. The war, the battlefield, is in the mind. The wins and the losses are in the mind. Freedom and bondages are in the mind. Addictions, doesn't matter what it is, starts in the mind. Deliverance from addictions always start in the mind. Yes, it's by the power of this Holy Spirit, but it's by the renewing of your mind. Because I guarantee you, nobody shoved a needle in there arm. Nobody took any drug. Nobody drank mass quantities of alcohol without some thinking behind it. So I want to call it out. I want to expose it. And let's go. First Peter chapter 5 verse 8 is our foundational scripture. I'm going to read it in the amplified version. Be sober. I love sobriety. I was an alcoholic for 9, 10 years. And I tell you, when you've been out of it, you appreciate clear thinking. You appreciate clear thoughts. You appreciate the sky is blue, at least it, down here, not in Washington it was, but down here, the sky is blue. The grass is green. Trees are green. Wow. Colors are real. It's a, it's a great thing. Sobriety. Be sober, well-balanced, self-disciplined. Be alert and cautious at all times. Where does all that take place? In the mind. Sobriety starts in the mind. Self-discipline starts in the mind. Alertness is in the mind. Cautious is in the mind. Because that enemy of yours, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, fiercely hungry, seeking someone to devour. Wow. I want to show you a picture of a guy. That guy right there. I've met up with him two or three times in Haiti. These pastors that we work with down there found this guy. He was totally possessed, totally uh, had been into voodoo for years, and voices were telling him, go kill yourself. They saw him running down the street, and they accosted him. It was like three pastors, and they prayed and casted out the demons. Now, let me just tell you something. I don't know what he looked like before, but I can tell you that man is clothed and in his right mind. Because three pastors said that's not good enough. To let somebody running to their own destruction, no, not going to happen. And they grabbed the guy, cast the demon. That's his wife right there. They live, in a little, they live in a room, not even a house. They live in a room, eight by ten maybe, and he's one of the happiest guys you'll ever meet because he's totally free. But it started in the mind. It ends in the mind. His freedom is de dependent on him keeping his mind renewed. 
have you ever, once again, I, I'm, I'm just, I want to camp here just for a minute on the thinking. Have you ever bought something that you couldn't afford because you're impulsive? <laughs> have you ever said, ah, just for the heck of it, let's go look for a used car? And then you're driving home a new car, and you're thinking, what just happened? You got seduced. You got sold something that you didn't need. And that happens every single day. I, I, was in, I was in Mexico one time. I was in this pool. I get to talk to this guy. He's a lawyer from Michigan. He goes, yeah, just bought a timeshare. <laughs> he goes, that one up there, he points to this big, big thing, man, big, flat. I said, hey, and I, and I sometimes ask too many questions, but I said, hey, I'm, I'm just curious, how much was that? He said, $43,000. I thought, that's a lot of golf. <laughs> I said, how many weeks do you get a year? <laughs> I don't think he went to va on vacation thinking, I'm going to spend $43,000. Now, $43, now, maybe he was one of those lawyers that had piles of $43,000 all around his house. And so wherever he went, he just took forty three. Maybe he did. I don't think so. But for one week, my point is, he didn't anticipate that. He got sold it. He got seduced. And it all started with his mind. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. Now, whom you forgive anything, this is Apostle Paul, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven any, anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Paul's thinking was forgiveness was necessary towards somebody to model to them that it's not optional. Forgiveness has to be done in the presence of Christ. Your thinking affects people around you more than you'll ever realize it. And Paul's just saying, this, this is a truth right here. Why? Why did he forgive? Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. What's he saying there? He uses lies, schemes, plots to confuse the mind. He outwits, he lures, he tricks, he captures by sneaky means. So every day, the devil goes fishing. Well, I don't know if I believe in a literal devil. Well, you don't have to, because he's real. And, and he's trapping people, he's tricking people, he's outwitting people, and he's been, he's been tempting and seducing people much longer than they've ever been resisting him. He knows what he's doing. He knows the right bait for you. See, for me, I, I, I've never been tempted with smoking. So, it's like, I'm just not going to walk into a store and buy some Whatever cigarette, Marlboros. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not just not gonna do it. There's no appeal. There never has been. I grew up with asthma. Both parents smoked. I should be dead by now. Secondhand smoke. Um, but that's not where I'm gonna get. Where are you gonna get tempted with? Well, somewhere in the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You know, for me, I have to guard my mind. Food. Food can be an idol. Food has been addiction. I love food. I love junk food, sweet food, sugar food, candy bars, cheap Walmart cookies, three rows deep, lemon filled, buck 99. Love it. Can finish a whole pack in an hour. No problem. <laughs> food. It's not the food. It's the thinking that goes with it. what you think that junk food can do for you. Or lust. Or whatever. You know, you got, I guarantee you, you got your own. The devil knows, and he's just going to keep throwing and throwing and throwing and throwing to see if you'll take the bait. He's crafty. I was fishing in North Carolina six years ago. I'm going to show you. That's me. I'm happy. That's two bass. That's one lure. Everybody say, two bass, one lure. Does he know how to fish? I rest my case. <laughs> two bass, one lure. That's a twofer. No, that's, that's real, man. That's right there. 
And the guy that was on our boat, you know what he says? He's from the south. We were in jo- I went to Georgia, drove to North Carolina. He goes, I've been doing this 15 years, and I've never seen that before. Because I'm a Yankee, man, and I know how to fish. And that's what the devil does. He keeps throwing it out, keeps throwing it out. Get greedy, get resentful, get bitter, blame people. Boom. And you're like, oh. That's what he does. You ever been hooked? You got hooked by a thought. I get hooked by a thought. You go through the Bible, you'll see the Bible will talk about confused minds, troubled minds, dull minds, double-minded minds, blind minds, corrupt minds, depraved minds. There's a lot about how, how bad our, our thinking can be. Re- research shows that 87% of illnesses can be attributed to our thought life. 13% to diet, genetics, and environment. 87%. It's here. The devil knows win the mind, you win the body. Financial realm, win the mind, win the finances. He knows exactly. Win the lust of the flesh daily, own the destiny. He knows that. He's been doing it. And you and I see people. That happens. They get robbed. They're not sober thinking. They're not disciplined in their mind. They give their mind to trash. And then they wonder why all kinds of craziness is going on in their life. It's thinking. That was the way in. It's the way out. Now, as all as I want to do is I want to talk about three major areas <clears throat> of dysfunctional thoughts and thinking. Now, once again, could have come up with a million, but I, I want to just highlight three that I see. I've seen in my own life. I've seen in people's lives. I've seen in church lives for many, 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 many years. I'm sure at least one of these will apply to you. Maybe you'll go three for three. I don't know. Here's the first one. Dysfunctional thought number one. Relationships are expendable. That's a dysfunctional thought. That they're replaceable, they're non-essential. What was true in Genesis 1.18 It's not good for man to be alone has never been more true than 2021. So if if you're somebody, and once again, you don't get to that state overnight because you're wired for relationships. You're wired for, for close connections with people, deep connections with people where you're known and you know people. That's the way you're wired. Until you find that, until you engage in those kind of relationships, there will be a restless search or aversion the rest of your life. See, you can't, you, you can't mess with the fundamental design of how God wired you. So if somehow you've come to the place where I don't need relationships, I will tell you that's a demonic thought from hell. And let me just say that if you bite on that kind of thinking, you will live, I'm going to say, mostly in defeat. And I'm going to say you're probably never going to get where God really wants you to because nobody does it alone. I mean, Jesus makes the strongest case for doing ministry in teams. I mean, I would have thought he could have done it alone. If I'm betting chips on, I'm I'm betting on Jesus, but he didn't. He called 12. Because he needed them? No, because he wanted them. And because he wanted to model how the church is supposed to function throughout every generation. You you can't do it alone. We can debate, love to debate you. You won't, you can't. You may have a season, but I tell you, and you may die alone. And I can't think of a more terrible thing. To find yourself at the end of days, nobody's calling Nobody's texting. Nobody's there for you. It's not good that man is alone. Now, I understand. You grow up with abuse. People abandon you. People reject you. You got shame. I get it. I get it. Yeah, it's like, okay, they might bail. Yeah, they may. They may hurt me. Mm, Yeah, they may. But you're still wired to connect with people. And so in between that, thinking that you're in self-preservation mode and thriving in relationships, the thinking in between that gap is what really has to be gone after. Don't have time to go much more into that, but when you think about what Jesus said, when they said, hey, what is going to be the, you know, the, the times and the seasons of your coming? 
He said, the love of many will grow cold, wax cold, actually. Apostle Paul said, know this, in the last days, perilous times will come. And then he gives a whole list of both environmental things that are going to be happening, as well as relationship things. And he says, people are going to be headstrong. They're going to be self-absorbed. They're going to be haters. They're going to be despisers of good. And they're going to be without natural affection. So if you don't have natural affection, what do you have? Unnatural affection. You don't need to read too much news to know, wow, people are embracing some pretty strange relational concepts. Unnatural. God forbid you call it unnatural, because then you're insensitive. Just saying. How do you see people? Do you see people as assets or liabilities? Threats, blessings, or competition? Once again, 1 Corinthians 13, 7, it's been quoted at almost every wedding. It's in every card shop on the planet. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That's true. That's just not a little meme. That's really true. What does it mean? Covers weaknesses. Can be confidential. Believes the best in people. Walks with people through difficulty. And endures. Is able to put up with long suffering a lot of people's poor choices. That's, that's what love is. You will never have to have a relationship where you don't have to bear, believe, hope, and endure all things with someone else. It's true in your marriage. It's true in your relationships. There is no perfectly compatible person that we're just going to walk through life, love Jesus together. There's not going to be any problems. No, man, we're people. We be messed up. <laughs> That's just true. But just, so once again, a little self-inventory. How quick are you to write people off? You don't have to answer, but, I mean, just think about it. How quick, when somebody doesn't do relationships the way you think they should do, do you just, like, put the line right through their name, move on? Let me ask you this. How quick, when there's a relational breakdown, are you to go apologize, repent, speak the truth in love, and make it right? That takes something called humility. So, just think about that. Romans 12, 18. If it's possible, as much as depends on you, on who? Me. As much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Can you live peaceably with all men? No. Because some people are chronic jerks. They're just going to be. They were a jerk yesterday. They were a jerk today. They're going to be a jerk tomorrow. And you can't live peaceably. And I'm not saying you, sh you should, but after you make every attempt, every attempt... If they're abusive, if they're, you know, no, no, no. Now, let, me tell, let me tell you this. Don't be afraid of gaps in relationship. Once again, sometimes, sometimes the, the sweet, fluffy version of Christianity is like, we, say you're sorry, hurry up, say you're sorry. You know, you good? I'm good. Pat, 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 pat. And, and no, no issue really gets dealt with on a deep level. Hey, there's times where space is okay. You know, you read, you read Paul and uh, was it John Mark? Dude, went toe-to-toe, -to -toe, face to face. My paraphrase. Paul said, you go that way, I'm going that way. I don't like you. But we're going to go love the world for Jesus. <laughs> and they did. And somewhere in the space, Paul missed John Mark. He goes, you know what? Uh, this next place we're going, bring John, John Mark, because he's profitable to me and the ministry. Sometimes you just need a little space and a little gap to clear your thinking and realize they're not as diabolical as the devil led you to believe. That's true. Number two, dysfunctional thought number two. Uh, I'm just, let's do this. How many of you, I'm just curious, can relate to that first dysfunctional thought on some level? Just Okay, good. <laughs> you thinners. <laughs> dysfunctional thought number two is a real deal, man. Dysfunctional thought number two, living preoccupied with the crisis of current events. Okay, I may go off here a little bit. I just want to warn you. And if there's any insensitivity, I apologize. Because sometimes the exhortation outweighs the compassion. But I do want to be sensitive.
my wife, oh gosh. When you can quote death statistics because of COVID and how bad it is, more than you can quote scripture, you're owned. Just a thought. And I'm telling you, as you go through a year and you listen and you watch how people respond, I, I, I'm honestly kind of bewildered at how people in the church responded no different to the people in the world. World hopeless. A lot of people in the body cross, hopeless. I'm not saying it's not real. I'm not saying people don't die. Please don't, don't hear that. I get it's serious. But when you're owned in your mind and you're thinking the way the world's thinking, where's the hope for the world? If you, I mean, if you're just subject to, it's bad, the sky is falling. I mean, that's the way you live and that's the way you think. You have nothing to offer people. Now, I'm not saying, sometimes you get a little weak. I get it. I had some fears. I remember going to the bathroom in the middle of the night in March when this thing was rolling. And I remember thinking, what does that little thing look like? That little, you know, COVID thing, man, that virus thing. And does it like just attach to you? Just you, f- inhale it? And then all of a sudden, you get, no, I'm serious. You, you get crazy thinking. You get crazy thoughts. I'm just saying, preoccupation is what I'm talking about. People scouring the news every day. And let me tell you, the news loves to serve up the worst case scenarios because it's great for ratings. And when you look at all the headlines, it was all fear-based, quarantine, lockdown, pandemic, death, catastrophic, worse than imagined. Death tolls off the charts. One new strain, two new strains, four new strains. England's getting in on the action. They got their own strain. And it's like, oh my God, where, where is this going? And then you're preoccupied with it. And you're not spending time in the word, and then you're owned by it. I mean, once again, I don't have time to get in depth with a lot of this, but one article said the constant bombardment of negative news can result in heightened anxiety and immediate effects on our mental health. But the constant feeling of threat may have other more insidious effects on our psychology. Isn't it interesting that every news story, it just seemed like every news story used catastrophic language. If the language is catastrophic, then the hearer's thinking is catastrophic. Tell me where is any hope in that? There is no hope. You want one nugget? How many of you would love one nugget? Just one nugget. You want I got a nugget, man. Here, here's my nugget. I'll give you one nugget. Shut off the news. Open the word. That's it. I used to be a habitual daily news junkie. And after a while, I thought, this is poison for my soul. No, this is not. There is nothing redemptive here. There is nothing that is causing me to follow Jesus harder or do anything. It's all it's doing is suspend my anticipation and hope for a future. I had to shut it down. I'm a once a weeker now. Man, you got to know some stuff, right? And so, so here's what I believe was the overarching thought from January to the end of de- December by the average person in America. 2020 was all bad. I believe that's what people thought. It's all, it's all bad. The whole thing was bad. Every meme was all about getting out of that getting into this, you know? I mean, some of them were cute, some of them were stupid, but they were getting in people's minds. And you would think the whole thing was bad. Now, let me just tell you, I started thinking that way a little bit too. I did. But let me tell you something. Don't ever trust all of your thoughts. They're unreliable. And some of them are demonic. And so I had this thing. I'm just being honest, just being vulnerable. I started kind of going out. Well, this is my language. Whoa, can't wait till we get out of here. And then I thought, now wait a minute. One of the disciplines at the end of a year is I take out my phone and I go back over the previous year and I just reflect. And so I thought, well, I'm going to do that. So I went back and I started looking at my, thought, my, my thoughts, my, my pictures, 
And here's what I know. As I went through month to month, it wasn't all bad. And I would suggest for you, it's not been all bad either. But it's easy to think that. And so I started scrolling through pictures. And I'll just show you some pictures that reminded me. In an all bad year, we celebrated 36 years of marriage. So it wasn't all bad. There was one day in there that was good, and I got to eat as much cheesecake as I wanted. I mean, there was one good day. Okay, maybe we can build on that. So I kept scrolling. Oh, what? Are you telling me a grandson was born five minutes before I preached on Easter? Yeah. Oh, now we got two. We got two days out of 365 days that something good was happening. Give me another one. Oh. What did we do? Oh, we built a church in Haiti. Oh, oh, wow, okay, wow. So a church that met in stones and mud, that was their building, is now in that. Oh, okay, wow, there's another one. Give me another one. Oh, oh, in an all bad year, there was 25 to 30 people that got baptized in Pakistan in a 98% predominantly Muslim country. Oh, wow, there's another day. Give me another one. Hit me again. Wow. You tell me there was a group of people out in the middle of nowhere longing for the word of God, getting prayed for, and some miracles taking place? Oh, there's another day. Here's my point. You got to focus on this. You got to focus and say, you know what? To say that the whole year was bad was to say that God wasn't fair. That's stupid thinking. Don't own that thought. Oh, gosh. Are you telling me a little over a year ago we started a Montessori teacher's training with 30 women in Pakistan? Oh, wow. Okay. There's another one. Give me another one. We got any more? Could be at the end of the road. Yep, and then it went dark. <laughs> See, it always does that, right? Just get, get a little hyped up and I knew that would happen. Here's my point. you got to challenge the way you think and the way you think about things and your perspective about things. Now, here's how it works. This thing hits right when we're, we're in Pakistan. We're just coming home. Then I hear a whisper. Wow, this is so bad you shouldn't, probably shouldn't travel. So the thought went from you shouldn't travel to you know, I don't think I should travel. Went from outside to inside. And the only thing that needed to happen was for me to agree with those two thoughts, one from the devil and one from myself. And it was at that point I said, "Mm, no, I'm not going to break agreement. I'm not going to make an agreement with those two thoughts. There's no way. Because what supersedes The devil's thoughts and my thoughts is the word of God. And as all as I need to do is see where Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation. And he didn't say, you know, unless there's a virus, unless there's a pandemic, unless it's hard, unless you value comfort more than going, then don't. He said, go, and he didn't qualify it. So I'm just simple enough thought, well, then I got to go. Hope my wife understands. But she does because she's godly. She's in the word every single day. She knows the heart of God. She's not about to get in the way of what God wants to do. <laughs> she's not. She won't. She would put time limits on the whole thing. <laughs> she, it's pretty effective, actually. But No, my, my point is you can't agree with that stuff. You can't agree with thoughts that say, you know what? You were raised in poverty. You're just stuck paycheck to paycheck the rest of your life. No, 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 no. Either God is generous, Genesis to Revelation, or he's not. Not only is God, when you know his heart, he is generous. He created creation to be generous. I'm always amazed when you go to these most barren places out in the middle of nowhere, Saudi Arabia, you know, all these places. There's crops growing. There's crops. They find a way. So don't, don't get into this all. It's all bad. Don't be overwhelmed. Don't be paralyzed. See, we, you can't, you, we can't choose what happened. The only thing we can choose is our response 
and our choices and how we view something. Once again, I'm not saying it wasn't hard, it wasn't hard, it wasn't hard. I'm going to leave you with this right here. Go through this real quick. Glad you're here. That's the cue. (laughs) Here's dysfunctional thought number three. It's too uncomfortable to examine myself and accept responsibility for my choices. It is uncomfortable. I don't, have you been to a doctor's exam? Have you been to a dentist exam? No, it's not fun. That's, that's how I ended 2020. I go to the dentist, they're gonna do a bridge. He goes, uh-oh, we got a problem. We got a lot of work to do, which is what my chiropractor says too. So I don't know if the dentist and the chiropractor talk to each other. Oh yeah, we got a lot of work to do, which also means a lot of work means a lot of. He says, you got an infection. He goes, we got to pull it. Let me just tell you, I didn't appreciate the results of the exam. I didn't appreciate the x-ray. I didn't appreciate what I saw in it. And I didn't, I didn't appreciate what he thought we should do. Such it is with exams. But he said, if you would have gone on the plane to go to Pakistan, your face would have swollen up that big. I thought, that's just a bad day. 13 hours on a plane with moon face. How you doing? What is that guy? I love Jesus. <laughs> big old fat head. So you know what? As uncomfortable as an exam is and him poking and prodding and drawing a little blood there, it had to go. And so when I went on a plane, my head didn't get big, bigger. <laughs> it was size proportionate. I think it was Thoreau that said the unexamined life is not worth living. Jesus said either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. A tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers. He's talking to religious people that supposedly represented God but accused Jesus of casting out demons by the spirit of the devil. That's bad thinking. Brood of vipers. How can you be an evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure in his heart speak, brings forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure in his heart brings forth evil things. Let me ask you a question. Who's responsible for change, Jesus or you? You. Who's responsible for what you allow in your heart, Jesus or you? You. You're responsible. He says make the tree good or make its, make its fruit bad or good or bad. And he's telling religious people, you need to change. It's not good. So let me tell you something. You're not going to die from self-examination. You're really not. You may not like what you hear. You may not like what you see. But if you really want to change, and you really want to change your thinking, you'll embrace it. Especially if you understand the grace of God. If you don't understand the grace of God, if you see God as a legalistic God, then don't do it. Don't do it. Because you'll be ruined. You'll be in despair. Seriously, you go eat Walmart cookies. It'll be bad. You will, it, it will not be good. But let's stand up. Let's just, I'm going to go through the seven areas of life that we live in. I just want, let's just, I want, it's all I want you to do is just, what sticks? What sticks here? Our thoughts affect every area of, the, of, of life right here. Physical life. Just quick self-examination. Do you have energy or are you exhausted? Leave it right there. Financial. Do you have freedom and generosity or debt and scarcity mindset? Just think. Relationships. Are people there for you? Is there encouragement? Is there challenge? Is there affirmation? Family. Your family. Is there love? Is there quality time? Communication, safety, and support? Spiritual life. Are prayers being answered? Do you sense God's love and peace? And is there anticipation? Do you live with anticipation that God will do things 
or is it just has it become religious, obligatory, go to church, clean up my language a little bit? Is there anticipation? That's one of the clearest indicators to me that my heart is being doing well with the Lord. I'm anticipating for other people, for myself, for my family. Career. Do you like what you do? Do you add value to where you work? Or are you stuck and at a dead end? Emotional health. Is there peace and resilience or anxiety and worry? See, once again, I'm not saying everybody doesn't worry. I'm just saying when Jesus says six times in nine verses in Matthew 6, do not worry, I got to be challenged by, by that. I got I, I, I to take him at his word. I got to say, if I'm given to worry a lot, if there's a lot of anxiety, wow, I'm somehow on some level disobeying what he commanded me not to do. So, talked about a lot of stuff. How many of you were just provoked in at least one area of what I said today? Just one area that the Lord kind of highlighted and said, pay attention to this. Okay. Romans 12, verse 2. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to prove what is the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. In its simplest form, renewing your mind is exposing the lie you believe, matching it up with the word of God, which is the truth. Sanctify them by thy word, thy word is truth. The only way you know if you believe a lie is you, you have the truth to compare it to. You embrace the truth over and over and it drives out the lies. You meditate on God's word, the word of God becomes a stronghold instead of bad thinking. I'm just gonna pray for you. Because we all have minds, we all have some good thoughts, good thinking, we all have some dysfunctional thoughts, dysfunctional thinking, and it's not God's will that you're owned by any dysfunctional thoughts. So put your hand on your head. Yeah. Some of you have twice, twice as many bad thoughts. Put both hands on your head. <laughs> okay, so Father, I am, uh, boy, I'm excited about this challenge. By what your word says about the brain and the mind and how even science says that the way you think actually changes the structure of your physical brain. You told us to renew our mind. You told us our mind could be full of peace and full of life. And if we would just meditate on your word, Jesus, the words that you speak are spirit and life. Paul's words, to be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. So I pray, God, help every person here. Just take, just take a new look at scriptures. Have a fresh passion, not born with legalism, but freedom to know you, the creator, the savior, the deliverer, the healer. So I bless every person in here, God. I pray in the upcoming weeks, there are testimonies where people say the spirit of God convicted me on this line of thinking. And by his grace, I changed. May we settle for nothing less than transformation in the way we think in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, and so be it, amen.